Amen. I know I'm thankful for the Lord's long suffering, forbearance at times that we mess up. He just doesn't squash us like a bug. Romans chapter 8. I think this, now, now James, this is going to be your last service with us here, even though you just got back. So he's moving to Colleen, Texas. And, and uh, so he's heading up to Fairbanks, I think, to get some stuff. So make sure you, you shake hands, let him know you'll be praying for him. And he just got back from Texas, but he's just moving back down there. And, and has the Lord leading him down there to Colleen. Romans chapter 8. That's it, preach Spurgey. He's ready to preach. Romans chapter 8, two verses here, two very, very important verses, and perhaps some of the most, well, I'll get to that here in a minute. Verse number 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I ask your blessing upon the message tonight. I pray that you would control what I say and how I say it. Lord, please, the truth here is so important. Help me not to mess it up. Lord, help it to be clear and concise and, and, and me to speak it in the tone and the clarity that is needed. Lord, use it to change us. Use it to draw us closer to you. And Lord, please bless Lord, I do pray if there's anyone here who has never been converted, I pray for that conviction and for that drawing, that even this evening they would repent and place their faith in Christ. May you be glorified and honored. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. When I was in uh, P&G, I, I, of course, when I went there, um, I, I, I had a, a lot of practical practical skills I was lacking. I was not a mechanic. I was not an electrician. I was not a carpenter. I knew none of those skills. And it was one of the reasons I struggled with the call in my life because I knew none of that. I mean, parents divorced when I was little. I did not have a dad in the home. Uh, I mean, if you could have watched me the first time trying to change a, a tire on the side of the road in the middle of the night when I was about 17 years old, if I didn't have an uncle and aunt who were out partying that night drive by late to stop and help me, I never would have got home that night. I would have walked home. I didn't know, by the way, they <laughs> asked me the next day where the other tire was. I put the spare on. I left it there. I thought it was done. I just thought you left the tire there on the side of the road. <laughs> I had to go back and get it. It was still there. I was glad for that. And... Uh, but I got to New Guinea, so I didn't have much skills, and, and I would need a lot of different skill sets. And, and one of those was electrical. A lot of different electrical issues would pop up. And I think it was after my first furlough, I had given to me a set of tools that were very high quality that an electrician would have. I think they were called Klein or something like that. Is that right? And, uh, and I was thrilled to have them. They looked super nice. And again, I often had to do different electrical repairs. But I was never very successful at it. Even though I had the right tools, I had perhaps the best tools you could buy, it really didn't matter because I didn't know what I was doing. It didn't matter. I had the tools there in place that I could fix it and, and do it. I did not have the tool, I did not have the knowledge to use the tools as they required to be used. I mean, at one time electrical, I had to, with the generator we had, how I powered the house, I did not know how to hardwire it to the house. So what I did was I took a really big extension cord, I cut off the female end, and I attached another male into that. So I would just plug into the generator and plug it into an outlet in the house. It worked. I did that for nine, nine of the years there. That was how I powered my house. I burned out several of those outlets it went into, but I would just replace those outlets. But one thing that will wake you up in the morning better than coffee is when you turn your generator on and you grab that mail in after the generator power has been switched, that will really wake you up in the morning as you get electrocuted by your stupidity. <clears throat> so there are many times, even though I had the right tools, I could not fix the problem. It would just lead to frustration. Today we're going to see that we have to have the right tool for overcoming the flesh. That we actually, excuse me, that we do have the right tool for overcoming the flesh. We have the best tool when it comes to getting that job done. 
So the problem is not the tool that we have. We have exactly what is needed to overcome our flesh. The problem is how we implement it, or many times we're not even aware that we possess the right tool for overcoming the flesh. This is a message that can help greatly. It can help you with the struggles of your flesh that we all have. Remember, Paul finished chapter 7, when he, the, the last several verses, dealing with the struggle that every single believer has. The good that I would, I do not. Yet the evil that I would not, that I do. Finishing up with, O wretched man, that am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? As he's been laying the foundation coming into chapter 8, we can see the direction he's going in relation to the Spirit of God. And, and, and him trying to lay the foundation, really, to get to these words that we have in our text of how we can overcome the flesh, how we can serve Christ even though we are in the flesh. This message is so very important. Again, we are in one of the most important chapters in the Word of God, and I believe in today, in the two verses we are looking at, we have a key statement on how to overcome the flesh, how to win the battle of the flesh. Matter of fact, there might not be in the entire Word of God, of all 66 Bibles, more important words put together Uh, for the Christian concerning the battle he faces every day with his flesh. And those words are found in verse 13. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body. Those words and understanding them are key to the success in you overcoming your flesh. The Bible isn't a magic book. It isn't some some mysticism that takes place where you arrive at some set level and now you have the ability to overcome the flesh. That will never happen. I mean, is not our goal as far as our daily walk goes to overcome our flesh? So this evening, as we look at at these verses, I put it as three M's, mind, muscle, and method. So we need to see how we have the right perspective, how we need the right power, and the right methods for implementing the power that we have access to. So let's dive into this here today, and please listen. Please battle the different things that are going on in your mind that are going to try and distract you. Just, Just try and remove those, all right? You know, we've got 30 minutes right now. I want you to listen to this. I believe it can help you every single day. First off, I I put this as the word mind in verse 12. It says this, Therefore, brethren, he's, he's relating to what we have in relation to the Spirit of God who gives us life and peace. There's no condemnation. All that we have because of him. He says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. He starts off here in verse 12 and really into the first part of 13 as the importance of having the right perspective. That's what I meant by mind. You've got to see a certain perspective here, and this is just the foundation for where he's going. That's all this is. It starts here because for all of us, in order to get to that place where we were successfully battle the flesh, there has to be a measure of discipline and there has to be a measure of dedication. There's no getting around it. We live in a culture where we try to get around work. Somebody needs to lose weight, just give me a pill. Just, we, we don't want to do anything that requires work. I have news for you. For this, there's no getting around it. There has to be a measure of dedication, a measure of discipline about your life. So where he is starting at right now is giving you a, 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 a perspective, a motivation, if you will, to, to do what needs to be done. And he points out that we are debtors not to the flesh, but to the Spirit of God. The flesh, of course, referring to that unredeemed humanness that we've been talking about. That, that vile, sinful passion that's in all of us. That sin, it, it generates through this remaining, remaining dominion that it has in our bodies. That's still present. It's still there. It will not be done away with until we are in heaven with the Lord. But he uses the phrase here, we're not debtors to the flesh, of after the flesh, you shall die. The, the truth is, who we are debtors to, our obligation is to the Spirit of God. We're no longer slaves, in other words, to our flesh. I, I imagine you all heard this growing up, I know I did. 
that when it comes to the training of an elephant, regardless of how giant that thing is, I read that the trainers will use a giant chain. And, and they'll put it around. I, don't know if, I can't remember. I believe it's a leg. I believe it's one of the back legs that they'll put it around. And, and it'll keep him in a certain area that the elephant cannot break. And after a certain amount of time, remember it wasn't that long of a time, like I, I, I can't remember, a month or two months, whatever it was. They actually remove that giant chain from him because it's really not good for him. And they'll put on him a, a simple rope, something he can break like that. But he doesn't know he can break it. He got so used to what he learned was that big chain. And they learned, we don't have to keep the big chain on him. We can just go to a rope. If he senses something on it, he he won't break it. The truth is, when you got saved, the big chain broke. It's gone. But we just don't know it. We're just not used to it. We're so used to being debtors to the flesh, that's where we tend to stay. And so he's trying to change your perspective of your mind first. Of saying, listen, you're not debtors to the flesh anymore. That's over with. That's done away. We don't have an obligation to it. I mean, the truth is, think about it. The flesh has only brought trouble into our lives. The flesh promises you this measure of satisfaction. But when you go after it, you seek it, you find it only lasts for a moment. You know, you can think of those that try and find satisfaction or some relief in, 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 in some alcohol. They see it last for such a short time and it's done with. And the problems are still there. It promises you some, some type of satisfaction. You have it, but then, then it's just over with. And it's almost like the satisfaction is even greater than before you fulfilled it. The flesh just simply leaves you unfulfilled, unsatisfied. It leaves you hurt. It leaves you broken. Ask Esau. Our debt, our obligation is to the Spirit of God. Think of all that he's done for us through what he has laid out. He is the one who convicted you. When you were hearing the gospel preached, when you sat on that church pew and you were holding on to that seat, that conviction, that ringing and you were saying, this is true, you need this, was the Holy Spirit of God. It was him as somebody was giving you the gospel, grabbing hold of your heart and of your mind, of letting you know, you need this, this is true. That was the Holy Spirit of God. And the very moment that you decided to repent and place your faith in Christ, it was him who came in and regenerated you, who gave you life, who allowed you to be justified before a holy and righteous God, who gave you, as he already said, life and peace and no condemnation. Our obligation is in no way to our flesh. We are not debtors to the flesh. You don't have to serve the flesh. I mean, the truth is it can do nothing for us. It, it, the only thing that, do, well, here's what it does for us. It'll debilitate, it'll cripple you, it'll dishonor the Lord, it'll drag you down, it'll cost you blessings, it'll bring a chastisement on your life. There is no point in entertaining your flesh whatsoever. That momentary satisfaction is never enough and it's not nearly worth the cost that you will pay to experience it. And again, the truth is, he has given us in our mind this motivation to remember all that it is that the Spirit of God did for us, the one who genuinely cares for you, the one who wants what's best for you. He's saying, this is your obligation. This is what you're indebted to. Listen, the big chain... It's broken. It is. Which brings us to the muscle, the power. He says this in 13. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now, we need to make this as practical as possible. All right? This is getting to where the rubber meets the road of how we live the Christian life in relation to the battle we face every day with our flesh. We all have the battle. We see that the key, that this is through the Spirit. We are to mortify the deeds of the body through the Spirit. You see, he's not only the Spirit of life and peace in in a very real sense, he's also the Spirit of death to us. 
in relation to that body of sin, that he is the key in how we kill it and how we slay it and how we mortify it, the deeds of the body. There is not one battle in your flesh that you face that God's spirit does not have the power to overcome. Not one. This is the instruction that is given to us for the battle we face. How we, through the Spirit, do mortify. That is to kill, that is to destroy, that is to slay the deeds of this body. The sinful impulses, the sinful passions that go against God and all godliness. It is through the Spirit that we mortify the deeds of the flesh. So this debunks what many people try and do to gain victory in their Christian life. You don't remain idle. And just say, I'm just going to let God, I'm just going to remain idle. You mortify the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit of God. Nor is this some type of one-time event by the wording and the grammatical structure used. It's not some one-time, you know, I heard that always growing up when... Man, there was just one time when I was praying, I prayed all night long, I got filled with the Spirit, and everything changed in that moment. Man, hearing that over and over when I was 16, 17, I believe that. You know what changed my mind? It wasn't a sermon. It was never teaching against it. It was the fact of how I was living my life every day, and I came to the conclusion, that's nonsense. Always feeling like I could never achieve. Always feeling like I'm missing what the Christian life is about. It was complete nonsense that looking back now, I didn't recognize it quite as clearly as I do now. It was all based upon man's pride. It isn't a one-time event. This is something that we do every day in this battle until you die. The only way you will mortify the deeds of your flesh is through the Spirit of God. That's it. There's no other way. Apart from the Spirit of God, there will never be an overcoming. There will never be the victory you need. You will stay uh, unbeaten and defeated. The truth is flesh cannot overcome flesh. Humanness cannot overcome your humanness. Yet this is how often how we try and fight. And yet we have the perfect tool sitting right there. In the book of Zechariah, I love what he said when he said, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. This is the key for your life. I like what one commentator said about this verse. He said, if you don't kill sin, sin will kill you. So this is sort of twofold, and I'm going to make it very practical here today. So as we look at this, it's twofold, knowing we have life from the Spirit because of regeneration, but then the need for us through the Spirit to slay. So we have God's spirit to slay, to kill, to destroy the deeds and sinfulness of our bodies. The truth is, when you head out to really slay something, when you purpose to do it, it takes some planning. I mean, they got two moose out on their moose hunt. I think that's pretty good. But none of that was just random. I mean, they had scopes. They knew what to look for. They knew it was legal. Well, they probably didn't care too much about that, knowing, Greg, I've been hunting with that guy before. No, just kidding. But when you're actually going to slay something, it takes thought and it takes action. It takes both. If you're going to slay those vile deeds of your body, it's going to take thought and it's going to take action. This doesn't this just doesn't happen. If you're going to have, allow God's spirit, through God's spirit, for you to slay the deeds of your flesh, it takes thought and it takes action. It's not about indulging. It's not about pretending I'm strong enough to slay. 
It's kind of like this. This illustration came to mind when I was studying this. If, if somebody breaks into my home, and let's say he's a good bit stronger than me, which is doubtful, I understand that, but just for the sake of illustration, follow me. Let's say he's a good bit stronger than me. The truth is, in my own flesh, I, I'm not going to win that fight. I'll lose. I'll be harmed, I'll be robbed, or I'll be killed. So what I have to do is, is grab my gun, something that has the ability to slay, and use it. It's the same thing when it comes to those slaying, mortifying, means to kill the deeds of the body. you got to get the gun. If you just go at it in your own self, you're going to get frustrated. You're going to fail and fail and fail and fail. We have residing within us the Holy Spirit of God. There is nothing, nothing that we battle within our flesh, within our bodies, that he cannot help us kill. So, you say, Pastor, that's easy to say. All of us preachers say that. We like to preach that. But how does that work? So, I need you to listen to this. I'm going to give you methods, techniques, dealing with the Spirit of God, putting things together. And I hope this clarifies some of the practical things that we talk about in the Christian life. This is how you use the spirit to mortify the deeds of the body. There's no shortcut. There's no other way around it. There's no all of a sudden you pray all night and poof, you got it. This is it. All right? I want you to listen to these. Again, we have the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous to think that there's anything in it that he cannot handle. I think we all get that. So what do I do? Number one, and you, there's no skip in any of these, okay? There isn't, you can't skip any of these. Number one, it starts here. The others won't matter unless you start here. The devil will trip the majority of you up at this first one. It's personal responsibility. Okay? Let me explain this. There's different facets to this one. All right? In Romans chapter 7, as he was coming through the battle that we all face, he found in a law that when I would do good... What did he say? Evil is present with me. All right? That's very true. doesn't matter how good you can have things going great, but make no mistake about it. That sinful, vile flesh is right there waiting. Your goodness in no way diminishes the vileness of your flesh. doesn't matter how good you are. Doesn't matter how, how, how lately, how victorious it's been. Don't ever get naive about sin or it will destroy you. So I'm laying this foundation to let you know this from Romans 7.21. The problem, listen to me, listen to me. I'm, I'm driving at something here. The problem is not something without. The problem is you. It is. The problem is you. It's not your spouse. It's not your education. It's not your background. It's not how you grew up. The problem is you. Evil is always there. And unless you start with personal responsibility, I am telling you, these other steps won't matter. You have to take responsibility. It's not the culture. It's not the absence or the cause isn't my friends. It's not your education. The problem is you. You have evil indwelling you. It's there. We're so good at trying to put off and excuse our sin, and you will never get victory over it. 
so often we look for those excuses in our failures. It's always someone else's fault or another principal's fault. Uh, it, It was the devil. If I could just get rid of this demon, I won't sin. This demon's been plaguing me since I've been seven. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to prove it to you from Scripture. Listen to me. If there was no devil and no demons, you would still struggle with sin. The evil is within. You want proof? During the millennial reign, guess what? There's no devil and there's no demons. Guess what's still abounding? Sin. The devil gets you fighting the wrong target. The problem is you. Pastor Roach used to say it this way. I always liked it when he said that. I can't remember exactly. He used to always say something along the lines of how I am my own worst enemy. The truth is, of course, we do need to resist the devil. We don't need to give place to the devil. But you have to understand what he preys on, why we don't do those things, is he preys on your weak, evil flesh. That's where the problem lies. So the key is not an exorcism, but through the Spirit mortifying the deeds of the flesh. We recognize it with different people that have clear struggles with sin that becomes addictive in nature like the drug addict who is severely addicted to meth or heroin or whatever whatever the case might be. And we see even though the person wants to get out of it and the struggles that they have and always falling back into it and the, and the relapses are, are enormous. But we all know before we can ever, ever take the first step and any hope of getting over the addiction, he has to see the problem as himself. We need to pray as the psalmist did. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. So the first one is you have to get to a place where you stop making excuses for your sin because the truth is your flesh is enjoying you staying in it. And you're not a debtor to the flesh. Wake up. Number two. Please don't miss any of these steps. This is a passion for God. You gotta have a heart for God. You have to have that heart, your passion on Him. This is so important. If you're gonna mortify the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit, I am telling you, this is key. Look over in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. I hope after this simple point right here, it changes how you view church. Colossians chapter 3. Your passion needs to be on God. Look at verse 2. Set your affections, affection, excuse me, on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid, is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, uh, then shall ye appear also with him in glory. So what is it, where, where does it go next after that? Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. The key here to that mortification was the fact of where your affection lies. What has your heart? If the devil can get anything else to grab your heart, he will cripple you in your ability through the spirit to mortify the deeds of the flesh. He'll cripple it. The struggle will be in place and it will be real and genuine. The failures will be common. Now listen to me. I want to hit this. Clearly and strongly, this one right here is why you need church. This is why you need to be in the services every time the doors are open. This is why, by the way, I mean, except for those that providentially hindered, I know the Bronx are watching live stream right now. If you have the ability to be in church, you get in church. 
This one is why the passion for God, a heart for God, this is why we have church. This is why I'm standing here behind this pulpit. This is the reason why the study takes place. It is to get your heart and your mind back on God. To get you to a place where you're in a position to actually mortify the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit of God. to get your heart and mind back on God. Get your heart and mind back on the word of God. So the passion in your heart is genuine and it's true and it's focused on him. You see, as you come in here and you hear the preaching, the goal is this, is that I'm pulling you towards heaven away from this earth. To refocus your attention to get your thoughts from all that you've been going through at work and at home and all the different battles, to come in here and get refocused on God. Because apart from this, we have a weak flesh. You're not going to mortify the deeds of the flesh unless your heart is fixed on Him. Your affection has to be on things above. Or the mortification isn't going to happen. These are the things that the Spirit of God will use. Again, it is all about God. And I am here. We have church. We come into the preaching to keep you focused on God, to to keep your attention back on him. One pastor, he said this. I'm going to quote him. He said, I really like how he said this. He said, I'm here to jerk your mind back to spiritual reality so that you can fix yourself on God. And that's why we don't forsake the assembly of ourselves together. You need to be jerked back to spiritual reality, and I'm the jerk. (laughs) See, that's in one context you can properly call me a jerk. You see... If you come in here, you think it's just about the information and those things, and it's a mixture in all the services between teaching and preaching, between teaching and preaching. It's not about just the information. It's about getting you focused on God that hopefully when you leave here, a greater desire for his word, your your heart more in tune with him. I'm here to try and help you avoid complacency which weakens you in your ability through the Spirit to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Because when you eliminate these, you're going to try and do it in your own flesh, and it won't work. My responsibility, even this hour as we come on a Wednesday night, is to help your focus back on God, to draw you to a place of drawing closer to Him, to get things in order. Because of our weak flesh, I mean, we need this. We need our hearts stirred. That's why when you come in, man, when it's time, that, that's why all of our music isn't focused on you. It's simply focused on God. To get your attention on him. So when you come in, the preaching starts, man, be ready for it. You know, I remember, I, I, and I don't know who, and I don't want to know who. I remember, this is going back years ago, when I, I think when we set up the, the Masters Club and whatnot, I was with a bunch of preachers, and it took heat for the idea that I was having people still come into the service, that at 7.15, when I structured it, I wanted the people back in the service. About hearing, I just want people to hear me. It's a bunch of nonsense. By the way, that kept me up for several nights. You want to know why? Because if you think I want people that are struggling with a very real flesh every day, not in here for one single Wednesday night for nine months, you're crazy. It's because I'm the pastor. It's because I know what they're going to face. I don't want marriages falling apart and everything else to have them come in and get refocused. We have minimized the importance of the preaching of the word of God, yet that's what draws us back to him. So it stirs our heart and our mind to stay focused on him. I'm here to try and get your mind off worldly, trivial things that can so easily grab any one of us. And then we come in and we hear the preacher, we're like, yes, Lord, that, that is what I want. You need a passion for God. 
You need your heart set on him. You cannot skip these steps. It starts with personal responsibility. Then it goes to your heart on him. Next, I put these as all as peace, pressed upon by the word of God. Colossians chapter 3 deals with the word of God dwelling in you richly. I'll never forget, I had, I had no longer a member here, good, good person. This is not, it was not a carnal person, a Christian whatsoever. But I was stunned and shocked at the ignorance of the statement that was given to me. Uh, uh, a small issue come, I don't remember what it was. I remember it was nothing major. And I can't remember how it came, but I'd ask, well, why didn't you come to me? He said, well, I, was, I, I just thought you were just going to tell me to, and he'd never been in for counseling about anything. And so I just thought you were just going to tell me just to read the Bible and pray more. I couldn't believe what I heard. It's like we forget what we have. We don't even know how to use it. It's become the Sunday school book. We've gotten so used to what we have. We don't even realize it. But throughout, I mean, think of that. Under the context of mortifying the deeds of the flesh, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. If it was good enough for the Lord Jesus Christ to use against Satan, I think it's good enough for me. How about the psalmist in Psalm 119? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not depart from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And we minimize it. We throw it away. We want a new philosophy, a new way, and you are crippling yourself from being able to mortify because the power's not in you. It's not in your new philosophy. It's in the spirit of God. You need to be pressed upon with his word. You know what made Job so successful in all of his battles? Because he esteemed God's word more than he did his necessary food. We minimize it. When you read it, don't just read it to check your box. Read it to grow. Meditate upon something from it. Grab something from it. Think about it. I mean, if I went to each one of you today, what did you read today? The truth is, the overall majority would be like, um, I was in, where was I at again? <laughs> Meditate upon it. Work to memorize it. Allow it to do what it's designed to do. To change you. Take it seriously. This is how, what the Spirit will use. I am giving you the techniques, the methods right now on how you mortify the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit of God. It's not some mystical place. It deals with practical, genuine Christian living. Now, as I come into this one, I'm, 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 I'm going to ask you a question first. I want you to think about this. If right now, let's say the Lord Jesus Christ was to come in here, and you were given the privilege, and say it was just you, that you could ask him right now to teach you one thing. That's all you get, though, just one thing. I, I, I want you right now to teach me one thing. What would you choose? know what I love? The disciples' choice. Teach me to pray. Again, we've crippled ourselves and our ability to mortify the deeds of flesh through the Spirit of God because the devil has done a great job of getting you to set aside the weapons. We have to be a people of prayer. Oh, how we need this. 
Prayer is such a key to mortifying the deeds of the flesh through empowering the Spirit and allowing us to be in a position that the Spirit mortifies the deeds of our bodies. To be fervent, to be diligent, to be faithful in our prayer time. I mean, if we are to be sober, because there is an adversary, the devil walks about as a wearing line. I'm telling you, you will never be sober without being a person of prayer. I mean, genuine prayer. You know what genuine prayer does for you? And it's true. You can think in your own life at different time frames where you're at spiritual life. Genuine prayer before God when it's not a game. It forces a measure of honesty with yourself. It exposes secret sins. That genuine prayer weakens prevailing sins in your life as you commune with God. Because you want to know what you're doing? It's through these actions that you're allowing the Spirit through you to mortify the deeds of the flesh of your body. Prayer helps you fight off temptation. Prayer helps you find strength. And then number five, putting all this together. When these are in place, here's a big key scripturally what what happens. You're at a place spiritually where you want to yield. Yield to the Spirit of God. In other words, it doesn't stop temptation from coming. You're there, you know what temptations you struggle with, but I am telling you, when these things are in place, you have acknowledged your sin before God. You know it is in you. It, it, it's, not, it's not your spouse's fault. It's not this person's fault. It's my fault. You have set your affection on God. You've gotten into God's word. You're praying. You're there. That puts you in a place when temptation hits to yield to the Spirit of God instead of giving into that flesh. I mean, we can tie this in with the verses that command us to be filled with the Spirit and allowing the fruit of the Spirit to be produced in our life, which according to Galatians 5 is is complete opposite of the works of the flesh. This is a yielding. When the other steps are out of place, you're not going to yield. Do you understand that? You're not going to run to the Spirit of God. You're going to want to give into that flesh. The urge is going to be so great. You're going to give into it. You know that bitterness you've held on to for so long? You enjoy it in your flesh. You're trying to, you skip those steps though, when that temptation hits, when something pops up and it wants to rear its head back, and all of a sudden your flesh wants to give into it. It wants that craving, it wants that sin. And if these other things aren't in place, you're not going to run to the Spirit of God and say, Please help. Please, Lord. I, and He's going to be right to what you read that day. It might not happen to do with that sin, it doesn't have to. It has to get your mind off of it. On something else. This is putting you in a place where through the Spirit, you can mortify the deeds of the flesh. You have to kill it. It doesn't happen magically. It's where you decide, I will give up control of my flesh. I will run to God during the temptation instead of debating it a little bit. Running away for a second and running back to it. Playing your little game with it. Lord, I tried. You're not even at the first step of personal accountability. Because when your flesh wants fed, You just respond. You got to kill it. The chain was 
broken. Listen to me, it was. We're so used to it. We think, we think that big chain's still on us. It's not. We have indwelling within us the spirit of God that gives life and peace. And he's ready to be the spirit of death for that body you have. If you'll put yourself in a place of taking personal accountability for your sin. Not blaming it on somebody else all the time. Of having your affection on God. Being pressed about with the word of God in your life. Taking your prayer life serious. You'll begin to experience the yielding. The yielding. We can overcome. We can win these battles that we face every day. We have what we need. Listen, we have the best tool. It's there. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Let me make sure real quick. We don't have any visitors. Is there anyone here say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I don't know for certain that I'm actually saved or converted. I don't know. Heaven's my home. Please pray for me. Anyone here like that, would you just put your hand up for me? All right, Christian. Listen to me. There is so much in this tonight. So much I don't want you to miss. things that we're dealing with tonight are so important. The devil will do whatever he can to trip you up at any one of those. To get you constantly blaming somebody else for your sin. You're, you, it's, you're crippling yourself from allowing God's spirit to mortify the deeds of the flesh. The passion for God. Having your affections on him. That's why we come to church. The devil will poison your mind. What, you know, think of all the times that you get, and it, as a pastor, I don't care who the pastor, you get so frustrated. You can see people's minds even getting poisoned about church. Thinking you're crippling yourself. You don't even see it. You need this. We all need those times we brought back in to have our hearts stirred back on God. So our affection can stay on him. Then to be in God's word and not playing a game with it. Well, the devil will try and trip you up there. If he can't break your faithfulness, which for many, that's what will break your faithfulness. You determine, no, this is what I said to begin with. This takes a matter of diligence and discipline. It does. There's not a magic pill to take for this. If he can't break the faithfulness, listen, he'll attack how you're doing it. Guard it. If you're going to slay the, 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 those vile affections of your body, guard it. Protect that time. Then the prayer time, make it genuine and real. Not vain repetition. So you'll be in a place to yield. The Lord spoke to your hearts, right? You come and pray. Father, heaven, please bless this invitation. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet.